happens, you're doing something weird. Oh, I should put yeah. on my thing. But okay, fine. now we're live. <laughs> All right. Hey guys, welcome to the live stream for the Dandelion Dynasty full series review, spoiler and brief non-spoiler at the beginning. Very excited about this. It's been a long time coming, like 2,000 pages or more. Oh, well, that, that's just the last book, actually. So like like 8,000 pages, God knows. It's a lot. So uh, it's been a long time coming. Very excited to have a lot of great booktubers and people on the channel today so um y'all know who i am because it's on my channel um, i'm ian the reader and we'll go ahead and just introduce i don't know if you guys see it in the order i do but i see kyle jimmy pete yeah. and then alex okay so kyle you yeah. go and then we'll loop down all right hello everybody i'm kyle from the uh, channel read by kyle um i am a dandelion dynasty enthusiast i've read everything that ken lee has published at this point and he's now one of my favorite authors and i'm excited to talk about this series with everybody Over to you, Jimmy. Jimmy. <laughs> oh, I, I was waiting for the, the segue. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, so I am uh, Jimmy Nuts from the Fantasy Network, and uh, I love the Dandelion Dynasty, despite half of my Discord hating it and uh, trying to gaslight me into thinking that it's not good. I, I'm pretty convinced <laughs> that it is still. Um, and yeah, I'm excited also, as Kyle said, to uh, discuss it, because I've talked in length about the first two, uh, and I did kind of an overall series review of like, did it stick the landing, but I haven't got to talk spoilers. Uh, so I'm excited to get my memory jogged and also throw out some uh, worthless commentary. You're so hard on yourself. I try. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my dad would be proud. Hi, I'm uh, Pete from the Ponderings of Pete. Um, I also really, really love the Dandelion Dynasty and I'm looking forward to binging the rest of whatever Ken Liu has published, aka short stories. And maybe his translated work. I don't know yet. But uh, yeah, I also haven't talked about this non spoiler, and I'm super excited to uh, see what people's thoughts are on yeah. sacrifice and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex from Tall Guy Reads. I really enjoyed this series, and I'm excited to talk about it as well. Uh, I talked, did a Grace of Kings and Wall of Storms review and then a failed throne live show, but haven't talked about full spirit series spoilers or speaking bones. So I'm excited to finally talk about that. And I also haven't read Ken Liu's other work. So I've only read the Dandelion Dynasty. I'm excited to dive into his other stuff very soon. So yeah. yeah. Awesome. Real, qu real quick. Has anybody else read his short stories at mm -hmm. all? Like Jimmy, have you? I have not. Wow, I'm saving I've... them for next year. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it blows my mind that that's like his other published stuff is short stories just because it's like the literal opposite of what the dandelion died. <laughs> <laughs> like, he can write long fiction and short fiction just extraordinarily yeah. well, I guess. So you, and you can totally see it in like the grace of Kings though. It's like very short story style in places. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It's like little like kind of vignettes. I see it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. Okay. So like I said, we're going to go ahead and talk non spoilers first. Um, I kind of just want to know like everybody's overall feelings on the books and the series and uh, whether or not you thought it was a satisfying ending or not. Um, we can even do like your own individual ranking if you want of like how the books fall for you. Um, although I feel like most of us probably have pretty similar rankings if I had to guess, uh, just because yeah. I think there's some pretty strong feelings about certain books. Um, but yeah, so I'll go ahead and just say my thoughts and feelings overall. I think it was an amazing series, super satisfying. Um, it was a lot of work. Uh, I was kind of exhausted by the end of it in some ways, I'll be honest with you. You know, I don't think it's necessarily like a binging kind of series unless you're like a scholar, maybe, <laughs> then you could probably do it. Uh, but yeah, it was absolutely worth it. I will say I, I loved a lot of things about the ending. And I think the very ending, like the last like 20 pages are beautiful yeah. and one of the best endings of any series I've ever read. I was a little bit let down by the last book, a couple things, um, you know, uh, overall, I think I think the series is incredible and it's worth the journey. I think that it peaked in book two a little bit. And then I think book three and four were still really amazing and definitely worth your time. But uh, I still do recommend the series for sure. Who's next? Cool. I, I guess I'll go. Yeah, we'll just keep going. In that order. <laughs> yeah, okay. Sounds good. <laughs> you got it, um, Kyle. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I first read The Grace of Kings a very long time ago, like 2015. And I, I struggled with it a lot. Like I really, my wife actually thought I hated the book when I finished it. And I was like, no, I think this, I think this might be like a favorite book of all time, but it, it took me a while to get there. And I never read further until, uh, 
until the series is about to be finished. So then I finally read Wall Storms at the end of last year and absolutely loved it. So, um, yeah, I, I absolutely thought it stuck the landing. I agree a lot with what Ian said. Uh, there's like little things that Ken Liu does that I don't agree with. Like I wish that he would have changed, but the overall scope of what he's doing and the, the, the characters journeys and the way that the land of Dara changes over the course of the four books and the, just the, his ability to transport you into that world and think about the different philosophies of how to be a human what it means to uh live the life that we're living you know like what what is the human experience i just think is phenomenal um i just wish he structured things a little bit different but overall just a brilliant series i would probably say wall of storms is my favorite um speaking bones has a very very emotional satisfying ending but there's some bloat to it that kind of drove me crazy while reading it uh and then it would be grace of kings and then The Veiled Throne, which has a very, very strong first half and a second half that I did not like as much. Yeah, so um, I feel very similar. Uh, I thought Wall of Storms was the best book. Um, but just like overall, I thought the series is really excellent. And I also think that it's very unique in the sense of like where it stands in epic fantasy. Um, mm -hmm. There are definitely times wherever... Uh, it almost feels a little self gratifying uh, whenever you know there's a ton of engineering going on, and I'm like, all right, let's keep going. We're inventing Crimble, all these things, as uh, Pete told us before we went live. Uh, but I love that there were ideas and thoughts in this series um, that kind of developed into something more. Um, and we're used in multiple in multiple ways, right? So the advancement of the technology um, and of the people throughout the series is probably the thing that I love the most. And I do think that the ending is very, very satisfying. And out of everything that I've read, this would have to rank in the top half uh, and, and, you know, maybe even higher than that when it comes to just like an ending, like a satisfying ending. Because endings in themselves, I think, are inherently uh, polarizing. I think that that's just how media works now. It's just like endings are just going to be either hated or love it. Not many people in the middle. I uh, definitely love the ending. I do think that there are some times where maybe there's some bloat. Uh, I would, I'd be very curious to see what a, tr what a trilogy would look like here. Uh, I, I would love to see if, if there was a way to make this a trilogy. Uh, but with that said, I don't regret reading any of these books. I very, very much enjoyed it. And I'm sure when we talk about spoilers, we'll talk about some of the stuff that maybe bothered us a little bit. Cause I'm kind of curious to see what you guys think. Uh, but yeah, I loved it. I think my ranking has changed since I made my video, which is heresy, I know. But uh, it's actually Wall of Storms, Grace of Kings, Speaking Bones, and then The Veiled Throat. Because the more I think about Grace of, Grace of Kings, I know I really like Grace of Kings. Though. Me too. Yeah, like, me too. I think about that more than I think about any of the other books. I still think Wall of Storms is like the like that's the apex for me. But I think I like Grace of Kings more than Speaking Bones as a whole, which is weird to say. But Yeah. I can get behind that real quick before Pete goes. I just wanted to say, this is my thoughts on what Jimmy just said. I almost wish that the grace of Kings had like been its own trilogy and we had more time and like that mm -hmm. kind of war that was going on. And then we yeah. had the sequel trilogy of wall of storms and kind of like that next generation and everything that was going on there. But we'll I talk theoretically about agree, but maybe that would be too much, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that would have been a little bit too much, especially considering how like, that was like the diving board like that was like the springboard into the rest of what he actually wanted to tell um but uh with th this oh my gosh this series just blows my mind when i actually start thinking about it um uh i i i, I can't really do a ranking because there's bits and pieces of each book that i really love i love the the historical aspect of grace of kings i love the just i mean i can't agree that wall of storms is probably like the most well put together in terms of plot and all this other stuff um and then just i do think that the cooking the the, the cooking stuff in um veiled throne is underrated i really really liked that it was a nice breather in the rest of the amidst the series speaking bones was an absolutely phenomenal ending and there's this commentary that you could actually like it actually like ties back even to the very first book of this commentary of sacrifice and purpose and the purpose of sacrifice and what a leader will sacrifice for their for everybody else um and how that affects people going on in the future and like is the cost worth it that's just i don't know i i really like thinking about that type of thing um so i absolutely love the series definitely like top five series 
Wow. It's high praise. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I also absolutely love this series, and I think my rank would be pretty similar to most people. But I think overall, one of my favorite parts about the series is literally just the shifting of everything involved when it comes to the focus on the people. So whether it's um, religion or land or actual geography or uh, just cultural changes that happen and shift from book to book as we go from one generation of a dynasty to another generation, I just think that was extremely sad extremely fascinating from book to book. Um, I definitely agree that there were parts in especially books three and four that just felt bloated, which is why wall of storms is definitely my favorite just because it felt, I was never exhausted in that book. I loved everything that was in that book. And I felt like it was the best representation of kind of what the series, what I liked about the series with speaking bones coming right after it, just because I love endings when they're done. When I feel like, I really enjoyed them and I really enjoyed the ending and thought it brought everything together in a way that I was really satisfied with. So I would put that as my second and then crazy Kings right after that. I love that book. I know a lot of people struggle with it. Um, but for me, it just worked. It was, I, I think it was also timing. I kind of picked it up when I was in the mood for it. I didn't pick it up like as part of a read along or anything. So I think for me, I was looking for something different and I think that absolutely helped. And then Veiled Theron just comes just comes last because it's hard to have a... Uh, <laughs> I mean, it felt like half a book in a lot of ways. And I think that really hurt the actual reading experience. And for the fact that it is still a thousand page book makes it just made it a little bit tougher for me to get through. But hmm. overall, the series is phenomenal. And I yeah. really enjoyed it. I think we all kind of mentioned bloating, like bloatedness, bloatiness. I don't know. Uh, we, we mentioned that. And, and <laughs> one thing, yeah, or maybe just bloat. Yeah. Simply bloat. <laughs> uh, one thing I do want to say about when I say that, I always almost regret saying it immediately because what is bloat? Like bloat is only what exactly. does not apply to me, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Everyone in the, their mother tells me that Dance of Dragons is bloated. And I'm like, where? I love every word of that <laughs> book. You know? too, and, and there's Jimmy, many, many. Yeah, there's many other books like this. So I do feel like it's a little... Um, I don't know. I, I I don't want people to hear this. Like, okay, for sure, books three and four are bloated. Because Pete, I don't think Pete thinks they're yeah. bloated, right? Yeah. Nah. See, a little exactly. bit in speaking bones, yeah. but like. So it's just like one of those things, you know, it's a subjective term, um, but it feels like it has an objective weight to it. And I always want to mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. caveat everything I say and argue with myself. So that's just yeah. I wanted to I wanted to make that note about when I said bloat that that's just me. You know, also yeah. part of it is just that how much I love this series. It's like the fact that I do think some parts could have been cut or that didn't interest me as much. It's like the only thing I can really there's like a couple other things, but for the most part, it's like I love all of it. But also, did we need seven <laughs> pages of Admiral backstory? Do you know what I yeah. mean? Like yeah. so there's just like those <laughs> tiny things that but overall I do agree. And like, you know, there's um a chapter in Speaking Bones that I honestly, I just like, I skimmed it. I just did not like it at all. But I saw somebody else be like, oh, I love that chapter. And, you know, yeah. the cooking stuff, some people absolutely love. Mm-hmm. And yeah. some people really love the engineering stuff. So I do agree. Like, I don't think it's object- like it's bloated all the time. It's just more that Ken Liu has such a vast array of interests and he's trying to sh- paint this mm-hmm. whole world. And yeah, in no. doing so, sometimes people don't want to know about the invention of crème brûlée, and sometimes people are Pete and they love it. So <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that's exactly right. <laughs> well, I think it, it kind of feels like how you know how authors will have their unedited version, and Stephen King talks about this a lot in his book on writing. How like they'll have their first draft, and then like your main goal of the second draft is just to trim, like to trim all the extra stuff off. In some mm-hmm. ways, this series kind of felt like that untrimmed version you know he included everything and yeah it was valid to his version of the story which is the version of the story but in some ways it almost felt like you know that feeling you'd get if you read one of your favorite authors like untrimmed versions of one of your favorite books like yeah it's good stuff but like not necessarily wasn't necessary it was just you know all there so that's kind of how i feel about it but i still enjoyed and appreciated everything that he put into it i mean my gosh i can't think of a more ambitious four book series or like not like yeah. Malazan where it's like 10 or however many books, like he managed to do so much. I mean, and he has the page count to back it up for sure, but yeah. <laughs> uh, he definitely is ambitious with it. So, yeah. um, so it also felt like, guy. yeah, it also felt like everything was purposeful. So even if there was a plot point or plot thread, I was reading that I didn't feel I was a hundred percent into whether it was engineering stuff or a cooking competition. I knew that 
it would have some type of payoff. And I can't think of something that really didn't have any payoff or didn't what, help What about that seven pages of admirable, admiral backstory, huh? Like, where did that pay off? Well, Alex? I didn't mind that. I didn't mind that. <laughs> Bad take. For world building. Just say it's for world building, all right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It adds to the atmosphere. No, <clears throat> no he it... didn't die. He didn't. No, Spoilers he didn't for the seven page admiral. It, it moves A from point A to point B. <laughs> Seven trash, Ken. I'll so I'm sorry. It's trash. <laughs> Seven yeah. pages I don't agree with. All right. Well, any okay. other non-spoiler thoughts or commentary before we jump into spoilers? I have spoilers? a quick follow-up on Jimmy's um, ranking, which is, generally speaking, when you think about the series that you finished, do you tend to prefer endings or do you tend to prefer beginnings? Because I agree with you that A Grace Begin of Kings is phenomenal, but mm -hmm. I really admire a great ending, and so I think that's why it puts speaking bones over the top. Yeah, I think I think the ask of a final book is is much greater in weight than an intro. Um, in fact, a lot of times do we not tell people you just got to get through the intro like we are actually very forgiving of intros for some reason as readers and in the endings we are brutal. Uh, at least most of people are. So I will not deny that the ending I think accomplishes a higher feat of cashing in and all these things and making previous books a lot better. Um, mm -hmm. But for some reason, I really like the pace of Grace of Kings. And this is a uh, kind of a correlation that I've done. And some people don't agree with me, but I feel like a little bit of like Bernard Cornwell, like burn dog in there. Like I feel like Grace of Kings had that same pace of like Winter mm -hmm. King. And I really, really agree. like, yeah, a lot of people don't, but I don't know why, but I, the, the glancing over time periods, you know what I mean? And, and that yeah. pace, I really, really like it. Uh, so I think it'll, some people are like, whoa, way too much stuff's happening. But I actually yeah. enjoy it quite a bit. Um, so I still like Grace of Kings more. But I do think Speaking Bones is a more impressive book. I agree. Well, here's the question I think that we – do you guys think that if somebody were to read The Grace of Kings and they really weren't – they didn't like it, would you say that it's worth them continuing the series? Yes. Or do you feel like reading book one is enough of an indication of how they'll feel? I think it really depends. I don't think there's a blanket for anybody. It would – really depend on why they didn't like it but i will say yeah. i've talked to a lot of people who didn't love grace of kings and the vast majority of those problems that people have are very similar and they're not really present or they're different in wall of storms so i would say yeah. for most people trying wall of storms is probably beneficial um there'd have to be a really specific reason that I, I can't even think of off the top of my head that like didn't jive with you but i would definitely say so they hate all engineering <laughs> engineering it's tough. gives them hives it's a tough ass too because wall of storms is not a short book it's like yeah. 800 900 pages so you're like yeah that's right i know you hate this but just try this and i like i totally agree i think most people would benefit from at least trying wall of storms yeah. before deciding yeah. on the overall series but yeah can we kick mike out of this chat for saying burn dog corn dog dude yeah <laughs> that's that's his name though it's it's corn dog it's not good it's not good <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, on that note, any last non-spoiler thoughts, or do we are we ready to say bye to non-spoilers? Uh, um, pain, always pain. Just be prepared for this series to break your heart. Well, not just yeah. pain, like anger. I felt very angry at some moments yeah. in this series. You'll feel a lot of yeah. emotions: joy, like, anger, you know, fear. <laughs> I think it was very Alex way. in the chat, um, like Alex said, I, who. Uh, was like, you know, I'm like a quarter of the way into this book, and I don't know why you were saying that it was so emotional, Kyle. And then at the end, she was like, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, Storms is a banger. Which is All why right. I think the cooking competition comes at a really good spot. <sighs> if it was one book, I actually totally agree with you. The problem is the split. If, yeah. if, yeah. If the cooking competition was in the middle of a 2000 page journey and I just needed a break. Absolutely. But as a climax to a book, it was, it was a lot. There's a lot done. Yeah. Yep. All right. Here we go. We're going to jump into spoilers in three, two, one. Spoilers. Get off eyes. No, uh, no to me. No. <laughs> Well, last time when we did the Wall of Storms oh, no, uh, spoiler thing, I was like, <laughs> three, two, one. So Cooney died, and <laughs> they got really mad at me. They're like, what? Um, but, okay, uh, so, yeah, we're into spoilers. Um, Ian and Pete, I don't remember which one of you actually said it in your Grace of Kings uh, live show, but one of you definitely did, where you guessed that 
there was going to be a dandelion flying over at the end. Was it and me? I told that to Ken. I was like, oh, yeah, somebody that I know guessed ending. I don't think I, it was I, me either. Was it Nico? Maybe. I don't know. It was in that live show for sure. But I just I'll thought it was back. crazy you guys guessed the, ex- the ending. I don't know. Yeah. I've been through a lot of uh, engineering montages since then, so I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> what was your guys' favorite invention? Oh, man. I thought the Silkomatic force was just so cool and it was such a twist like i didn't see it coming really and it just came out of nowhere i was like what that's crazy yeah i loved the fake out with uh hi we're gonna have bird controlled rockets yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> and then he was like no they just they, they focus on light and i'm like okay that's cool that's that, yeah. that's dope i, I really like that i like how everyone was like he's finally gone too far and then they're like oh okay it's fine <laughs> yeah i wonder i, how I thought i like the I love the inventions of book four. I just felt like by the time we got there, I was just like the actual explanation of getting to the invention was yeah. pretty exhausting. Yeah. exhausting. Yeah. So uh, I don't know, maybe you know this, Kyle, or maybe I missed it in one of y'all's discussions with Ken, but did, with like his thought process, do you think it was like he thinks of an invention that he wants to introduce? And then he's like, okay, let me go back and like figure out how this is going to work. Or do you think he starts off with like the process and then transitions into like introducing it into the story? That's a really interesting question. I feel like engineers are most, more likely to come up with the problem and then how to solve it, but I don't know for sure. I didn't ask him. That's okay. a great question, though. I It seems like yeah. something where it would be like, we need to, like, because a lot of the setup would be there's a battle. And then so it would be like, how does this battle play out with new evolving technology? And so it feels like it would be, then be like, well, what if we introduced, you know, bird rockets? And then he went and he, and he was like, wait, 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 that won't work. And he's like, you know, like, that's how I guess it would happen, but I don't know. I can see that. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, as far as I can't remember, I think Alex, you just said this, like how the whole, okay, we have the invention and then kind of going back and doing that was kind of exhausting. That was one frustration. And like, I know he did it throughout the series, so I shouldn't have been surprised, but like, you've got the final mm-hmm. confrontation between like Firo and Ghost Han or however you say her name. Um, and then like the battle's going, it's really intense. And then it's like, okay, let's go to 50 pages of mm-hmm, explanation yeah. for how we got here. And he does that, but he doesn't just do it once. He does it like four times in the same battle Mm -hmm. so the battle lasts like a very very long time and for me as the reader like sometimes that's forgivable but especially like when you're in the last book like i want to be at a point where that's not as necessary like almost like i know everything i need to know i know where things are going and i can just focus on all right this is it you know yeah it's distracting yeah i wrote down in my notes i put the liu formula problem in battle two flash back to an engineering solution for said problem (laughs) in battle three problem overcome yay (laughs) <laughs> no, you guys are being very harsh on this. I'm going to defend it a little because this is actually a moment that I liked it. Um, and in speaking bones, generally speaking, most of the engineering bothered me, but not there. And that's because I think it really maintained the tension. I, I get I, you're exaggerating. It was 50 pages. It was like 10 per time. It was, but it is. It was but, very. It was very jarring like for sure. Pages. Yeah, it was very jarring for sure. But what I liked about it is that when we then went back to the battle, I had no idea what was going to happen. So it. Like if you think about it in a different term, which is like if you had 10 pages of build up for anything and then that enhanced the next 10 pages, you would think that was really awesome. But because it, it's jarring intentionally, it creates something in your mind where you're like, oh, this is really like a slog. But then when you get back to the battle, you're like, oh, my God, that was crazy. So <laughs> it it I can get why people wouldn't like it, but I don't think it necessarily destroyed momentum like you guys are saying it did. Um, I, I definitely think it's the harder way to do it. Right, Definitely. as the author, yeah, yeah. like Absolutely. I wouldn't do it. I'd be like, mm, yeah, but ah, it worked. Like, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to explain that shit. Um, so, sorry, I didn't mean to swear. Um, but so it's definitely the harder path. But for me, it went along with this feeling of like things being convenient in the final book, and a lot of that yeah. stems from Gia. But th- like that plus this, right? Like them being in a bad spot. Then we go back to this engineering, and this thing happens, and it's like even though it's not like it's not convenient. Cause like, obviously there was work done in the past for it. It feels convenient as a reader. Does that make sense? Is that, mm-hmm. okay. I could see that. Yeah. I'd agree. I actually felt like it took away the momentum at some points. Like I know I what agree. you're saying about. Built, yeah. Like, it, it would vary on the reader. I'm happened. just saying that I don't want to give the yeah. impression that like it, cause it oh, absolutely. could absolutely yeah. go the other way. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. And like the weird thing is it didn't bother me so much in wall of storms. 
I think like when there was the big battle in Wall of Storms, like I, I got it and I think it was well done. And I think it was still well done. I think it's just my personal preference as a reader. Like when I'm in the final book in particular, when like it's the, cause that was like the big battle of the book, you know? And mm -hmm. so yeah. for that to be happening, I was just ready for like guns a blazing, let's get this done. And uh, mm -hmm. Ken's like, no, nah, I'm going to do it my way. I was like, all right, fine. Whatever. It bothered it's me cool, way man. more in Wall of Storms. That's why Wall of Storms didn't get a 10 out of 10 for me. That Luan, the flashback in the mid where they like pull out the lances and then they're like, and this is what we're doing. And I'm like, we're in the middle of the climax, but because it's the climax of the book is why I think it bothered me versus hmm. the, yeah. the battle of Zaff and Gulf is like not that big of a battle, even if it's like the battle of the book, you know what I mean? So, yeah, but yeah, well, it's that, just expectations for readers. Yeah. And that's the other thing. Yeah. And, and it was my expectation. Cause I felt like that was in like my just normal fantasy reader brain. I was like, okay, this is the climax of the book, but that takes like place. Like, maybe the first half are like around the middle of speaking bones. And then you've got like 500 pages left of falling action, but also like the, the confrontation between Gia and Fyro or Firo um, or Pyro or Pyro. How the heck you say it? Kyle, how do you say Pyro. that? Pyro. Pyro. Okay. It's arson. Cool. Pyro. <laughs> yeah. So, so you've got, you've got that confrontation, which in a lot of ways is a lot of a bigger deal than, than the actual battle. So yeah, it's just man, Ken. Ken doesn't care about managing our expectations as a, a reader. He's just like, this is what I'm gonna do, and you can love it or not. So, <laughs> I think this is yeah. where probably like binging it hurt me. Um, I think if I had been able to take a break, you know what I mean? Because like, you kind of know what you're seeing, right? Like I knew I was like, guaranteed there's a flashback coming. Boom, it's there, right? So and it's fine. Mm -hmm. It's a structure. It, it's it's exactly what I should expect because that's how the other books were. Um, but I think this is kind of where, like, where I, I was talking about, maybe I wish I would have taken a little bit of a break. I think it would have helped here. Yeah. I also like, I know Ken has said, oh, he was excited. He didn't really mind about just literally splitting the last book in half because he was like, oh, when they're all out, people want, want to read them straight through. And I was like, I don't know if that would be beneficial to read the last two back to back, even though I would want to. And I think it'd be nice to do it. I just would be exhausted. Like, I didn't do that, even though I wanted to, because yeah. by the end of the third book, I was just i did Exhausted. he says they're intended to be read back <laughs> yeah. to back but that's asking a lot of your reader to read two thousand pages without anything in between yeah so. i think the structure I mean, of veil thrown into speaking bones is um not great um just because he split it directly in half but you could easily move like where um Takval dies and thera becomes the um head of the aegon you could move yeah. that forward and then still keep all the like cave exploration stuff at the beginning of the fourth book um, and then like, you don't even actually have to move that much of speaking bones to the veiled throne. It would be like 40 pages maybe. And then like maybe cut a little bit of the veiled throne or move yeah. some of the Fero stuff to be speaking bones, but ending it on that high would make would it feel great. more like a complete journey. And then yeah. it would mm -hmm. make the fourth book feel like they're starting from like a goal of like, now she's the head of the Aegon and we have to get here versus yeah, yeah. like, we were just literally dropped in media res again. I think that would have helped a lot. Personally. I agree. Well, yeah. especially because story I'm, felt so. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say. I remember I, I messaged you when Kuju is that was his name? Kuju died, or you got it blown up? The one that was taking. Oh over yeah, Kudya in Kud, book four. Kudyo. Yeah, yeah, I know who you're talking whatever about, his yeah. name was. When he died, like in the first two hundred pages, I was like, one, it felt a little bit convenient, but I was still surprised by it. But I remember messaging you that, and you were like, that should have been at the end of book three, and I was like, I, yeah, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, especially it was frustrating for me because, like, in the end of The Veiled Throne, you have the cooking competition and you get these, like, tiny little flashbacks to, to Thera and them, like, literally, yeah. like, a page or something a like page, that. And, yeah. and that's where it could have been. Like, it's almost like he wanted to remind us, like, yeah, they're still here, but he could have. He, I 100% agree with you, Kyle. If he'd moved that over, it would have felt like, oh, my gosh, this is huge. It would have felt like an ending. So, yeah, yeah. Hmm. kind of frustrating. But. It was the uh, Dance of Dragons effect. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm going to start keeping a tally of how many times Game of Thrones comes up, shall we? That's what <laughs> two? I'm Finn's holding back. Tonight. <laughs> I was going to say Jimmy's holding back. I was like, that's only two on the live stream. Beforehand, I could add a, a yeah. couple, but yeah. <laughs> speaking of uh, Game of Thrones, though, one, and I, I'm speaking as a fake fan of Game of Thrones because I've only read book one and I've watched the show. I'm really sorry. I know. Um, I... One character, uh, Firo or Firo, whatever, man, um, reminded me kind of of like Firo's a Pokemon. Is I it? Say I thought it was Firo. I'll be honest. Like, That's I, I, I was gonna let Firo's you. Firo's that but... like big bird Pokemon. You know, 
I don't know. I, <laughs> I think I think blame Kramer. Blame blame Michael Kramer because I think Hero. he's a hero. Um, he kind of reminded me of like Rob Stark a little bit, you know, as like kind of the king of the oh. north. He gets like, oh, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Because I'm no, like, no, I, you're I, you're I, much more. I, just, I, I, just wanted, just like... I wanted to put this thought out there and see what the uh, well, people who've read all the books have to say about that. Well, no, I mean, I think you should continue because mine has nothing to do with Rob Stark. It actually has to do with Fire Rover, like just by himself. And I have a question about him that I don't understand. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say like his whole having this smaller following that kind of gets built up and you kind of have this hope like, oh my gosh, maybe he is really going to take over and he's going to become the one who gets on the throne. And then for it to just end so abruptly the way that it did. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was it wasn't like a, a Timu kind of abruptly kind of death. No. Uh, but like I, I was so frustrated by the confrontation between him and Gia and we'll get to that more later, but it, it just kind of, I felt like a weird like parallel there where I was like, oh, this kind of reminds me of Rob Stark, except y- you both died. So there you go. Sp- spoilers for Game of Thrones and the song. Oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> everybody dies. It's fine. Just assume everybody dies in Game of Thrones. Well, I would say, Rob, I, I understand how he came to his end. Got it. Fyro, it's like, all right, he couldn't be a good emperor. It seems like that is just what everyone's accepted, right? In this story, like he's just not, he's just, he's not going to be good. So instead of like, I don't know, like trying to talk to him, maybe, you know, maybe change his mind on things or like, he's got to die. Like, there's just no other way. And it has to be this way. Yeah. So everyone, like, we have the proper ruler. And I'm just like, why can't people change? And I, that was like yeah. my one, probably the biggest issue outside of like the things that we're talking about, right? Yeah. I felt like there was like a, almost like a message of like, people can't change. Like he can't change. He could never be a good ruler because of who he is like inherently. So he has to die. And it was like this sacrifice, but I'm like, you could talk to him a little yeah. bit. The talking is not it's on the, on the I table. Think you read it wrong. Jimmy. Uh, yeah. Probably. It, I mean, no, it, I'm, I'm being serious. I'm being though. genuine. No. When I ask, like, can someone explain this? To yeah. Me? Um, Pete, so, do you agree or disagree with? So Jimmy? I, I see where you're coming from, but I think that, that at the end where, when, when he died, there was a moment of, oh, he has changed. Like his decision to not become, oh, I'm just going to go forward with the invasion anyways. Like that was a decision that indicated to me that he was changing. Mm -hmm. And then right before he died, there was a moment where Gia was like, I was afraid that you you couldn't change or whatever. I was like, wait, is she realizing he's actually changing? And there was a moment that I was like, no, he is changing. What are you talking about? And then Gia started her whole self-deception thing again. And it was like, you can never change. And then Fira took out the bomb. See, what like, if Gia um, like actually just mentored him instead of exactly. like... Yeah, that's kind of... Well, that's the... <laughs> yeah, I think the, a lot of Gia. this falls on Gia and not yep. the society, which is that Gia's flaw is that she does not trust. She exactly. thinks she knows better. And so she does not trust Fyro. And so not trusting him to be able to be, you know, mentored, to be able to... Um, just to let him in on the plan. I, I fully believe that if she had came to him and be like, look, this is the plan. This is why I have to do it this way. I know that it's hard for you to stomach, but this is why I think this will be. He might not agree right away, mm-hmm. but I do think Firo is capable of coming to that understanding of why she was doing it the way she was. But mm-hmm. he didn't. she didn't offer him that chance. She decided for him that he couldn't change, that he was always going to be this idealistic Mata Zindu worshiping dude. And mm-hmm. I think the narrative is the, the exact opposite of what Jimmy's saying, where okay. the narrative is telling us <laughs> that she was wrong, which yeah. is that he did change. Exactly mm-hmm. what Pete said. He the, the he thought of Rasana and he thought of the honor of God, God's tan and how these different things make him realize that he doesn't want to be that way. And he he changed. He was in the, he was still very young. He was like 20, 22, something like that. And he was able to make that movement of change and. I don't think it has been a little bit since I read, but I don't think Gia killed him. I think he killed himself, right? He did kill him. the pit thing yeah. that she had. Yeah, yeah, so I, I yeah. always got the impression that Gia yeah. was trying to preserve him for after the, her plan. Because she yeah. wanted like a constitutional monarchy where, you know, it was more of like a council. They had power and like a kind of like a, like a queen of England type thing where there's like a head, but not as powerful. And I think she was saving Pyro for that. See, now I'm saying his name differently, but, and so she, cause she was very upset when he died. She was not expecting that. That was not, that was where her plan failed and her plan failed because she, of her inability to trust people. 
<laughs> yeah, I think that that's fair. But like, I felt like, and this is how I read it. And by the way, I'm not above misreading things. And actually, I was just messing with you. You're no, 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 no. But you're right. I, I will say this. I think you're right because I've seen like some things leveraged at like Grace of Kings before that I'll be honest, I think are totally ridiculous. Yeah. Um, sexism, mm -hmm. other things like this, um, or yeah. fake feminism. And, and to be honest, I think that there's not enough in reading. And this is kind of outside of what we're talking about here. There is not enough uh, accountability on the reader side of things. Um, you know, uh, I heard AP uh, critical dragon say this once. And he said, you know, if you have a pitcher and they throw it to the catcher and the catcher misses, they blame the pitcher. Right. But sometimes it's the catcher's fault. Right. In baseball. Yeah. So, so I don't think we take enough accountability as readers. So I am willing, I'm probably did read it wrong, but when I read this, I felt like, uh, by the way, sorry about the tangent. I don't know. I'm scared. No, I like that's, it. That, no, that was that's great. That was a great point. point. Yeah. Um, Fyro, uh, I felt like it was supposed to be this noble thing that like he killed himself. Like I was supposed to be like, yeah. that's so sad, but this is great. Like for the, for the, uh, regions. And I was, I was just like, kind of like, eh. Um, and I then like, the, the, that way. yeah, exactly. I'm probably misread it. I'll be honest. Um, it's up for interpretation, no matter what you, you, you shit on yourself so much, Jimmy, like your, your take is a valid <laughs> our take. I'm just telling you why you're objectively wrong. And I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think one of my issues was everything felt a bit perfect for Gia. Um, but now yeah. hearing what you just said, it clearly wasn't perfect. So that mm -hmm. makes me feel a little better actually about their conflict now. Um, but like her being cast out as regent and it being a part of the plan and this stuff, I, I was just like, eh, I struggled with it a little bit, but now like really she, she, she was wrong. Right. So she didn't get what she wanted. She wanted to preserve Fyro. But um, can someone explain to me why he killed himself then? Like, why did he? Well, I, don't well, think... I think. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Ahead. Yeah. No, no, please. Well, I don't think he like one of my favorite quotes from the book is um, something that Farah says near the end, which is that he lived up to the story. He wanted others to tell himself to tell about him hmm. instead of the story that was true to his soul. And I think that is like literally sums him up in one sentence he was very idealistic he really wanted to um personify what his heroes you know jin yeah. mazodi uh mata zindu and then later on like you know uh got stand to a little bit just like the honor and the enemy kind of thing where he wanted to preserve these ideals of what he felt like was idealistic about who he wanted to be mm -hmm. and then his you know his friends were dying like out there and stuff and i think he just decided that like this is the more noble way to end things because he did he wasn't reading the book he didn't know gia's crazy machiavellian plan so he just thought well i don't want to be tortured by my stepmom i don't want to you know be used as a scapegoat for a re failed rebellion or whatever that kind of thing might have been i think he just thought it was noble for him to go out and you know one and done hmm. yeah, yeah. it's also interesting because in uh kyle you were i think it was one of the videos you did with ken that was spoilers he was talking about how he was trying to write Firo or Firo to be the emperor, like to be the emperor he wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And then it just got to the point where he, he couldn't. And he just wanted to, he believes that he got the, the ending that was the justice for himself. And that's how like Ken views the whole arc of Firo. And yeah. I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Because I think I, you know, I, when I was reading it originally, it definitely felt a little bit convenient in terms of how to handle all the storylines. But then after looking at it, um, and hearing Ken talk about it, I was like, oh, okay. I mean, mm -hmm. so I was kind of mad cool. at him though, also, because he's like in there having this long discussion with Gia and the Blossom Gang's out there dying yeah. while he's like having yeah. this conversation. It's like, dude, get on with it. Cause they're like, surely he's <laughs> killed her by now, right? And then they're just dying. And he's like, no, I got to talk to my stepmom. Sorry, guys. <laughs> like, I was like, that's messed up, bro. <laughs> the, the Blossom Gang dying was very moving. In fact, one thing that I really love about Ken is his ability to make a like a small character matter in a small mm -hmm. amount of pages. I think it's his short story writing because when yes. Fan Kikoru died, whoa, got me right in the heart. And then like when the Blossom Gang were dying, when um, Mo, Mo, Moda and uh, Lady that I'm forgetting the name of Pete, help me out. Name. Come on, Pete. Damn it, Pete. Oh, look. <laughs> right now. You should Pete's know. Fact checker. Um, but when they when they both died, like that was very, very yeah. moving to me. And they were like pretty minor characters. So mm -hmm. well, I, I honestly I struggled with the Blossom Gang a little bit, just like remembering everybody as we were going. But he did have like yeah. that reminder right before those two characters died that they like loved each other and things like that. So like at least he kind of brought it back because otherwise I would have been like, wait, who died? One of the well, brothers was in three Kings. books. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was, right. There's Moda like a billion characters. <laughs> 
No to me is one of the most detestable. Oh my god! Oh, oh my all right, god. we're doing yeah. this. Okay, doing the oh, no to me no thing. To me. Let's go. No to me. And Kooten, uh, Kooten, Kooten Robo. Kooten Robo. Yeah, there's another one. Yeah. Dude, Ooh. I don't like him. He's a mean yeah. guy. Yeah, I think no is <laughs> worse for me personally. Actually, yeah, let's talk about that. Who's everybody's like favorite villain in the series? Either okay. way, to hate or to love. Okay. My favorite character is well, Gia, but yeah, is no she to a me villain? Is... because then I would say Gia. She's a villain. Well, yeah. okay, she is a villain, but like at this ending, like you have her whole like plan explained, and like I, th- I think she's just supposed to be super sympathetic. But is no to me is villain? literal trash. Is Thanos a means to an end. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no to me is trash. He's just a bucket of trash. Noda, yeah, but no to me is like easy to hate, and yeah. I hate him. But that Noda was like the most satisfying part of the whole book. No to me is so yeah. trash that I would rather like <laughs> he is a pile of crap, and I set it on fire. I would not throw that on anybody's doorstep as a prank because he is that trash. <laughs> <laughs> I I think I hate Gia more because of. Just the fact that I feel I don't know. Is there is there anything worse than someone who thinks they're smarter than they are? You know what yeah. I mean? Like there's like, something about that that pisses me rating. off. Or maybe well, it's like centuries well, of especially with regarding to military know. stuff. Like her, just like anything involving like Gia is fundamentally stupid when it comes to military matters. So yeah. whenever she would be like, "Oh well, we'll have like a military monitor," I was like. Oh. Well, but no to me is guilty of the same thing because he's like, all right, I'm going to kill all these guys and then I'm going to escape with the children. It's going to be great. I'm so smart. Nobody's going to see it coming. Yeah, and then they yeah, were just like yeah. waiting on the beach. And I was like, yes. Yeah, but here's, here, oh, well, you know, the difference though, they were waiting on the beach. Gia never had anybody waiting on the beach. She just kept killing people I liked. <laughs> <laughs> and it pissed me off. Yeah. So I feel, and, and like Gia could have made so many better decisions along the way. Um, like I expect No to me to be a bag of crap. Like that's yeah. what his character is. Whereas Gia, I was constantly ebbing and flowing between and appreciating her cunning to hating her. Um, mm-hmm. So for me, like the most visceral reaction I have is either to Kuden Robo or to Gia. Actually, yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Wait, who is literally like tossing babies in there? Kuden Robo. Yeah, Kuchan Kuchan Robo. Yeah, yeah that, that's pretty bad. That's pretty yeah, bad. when you're yeah. tossing we're, babies we're around, like baby like beheading, just a tiny bit. Yeah. <laughs> To I don't clarify. Know. Well, I think you mentioned it, uh, or I think Bookborn maybe mentioned it, Kyle and y'all's discussion, but like there was that moment with No to Me when he had killed Kutan Rovo and um, can't remember her name, but the other. Tan Vanaki. Uh, Tan Vanaki, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, ten, uh, ten re- oh my gosh, Timu was still alive. There's too many T names. Um, so Timu is still alive, and I'm like, okay, maybe this will be okay. You know, like it sucks that this happened, but like, okay, he's gonna get, he's gonna use Timu, and Timu is gonna like step up and be a man, and like, he's gonna be all right. And then it's like, nah, never mind, he's dying too. And then you yeah. just see his like head, like a couple chapters later, like you aren't even there when he dies. That chapter's mm-hmm. devastating. It's dude, that yeah. that whole section's probably my favorite part of the final book, and I love the fact that Timu outwitted him in the end, and that it played yes. off how important like linguistics yeah. and languages mm-hmm. in the world like that's the kind of stuff that i think is genius like i, I just think that that's what makes this series so much different than anything else uh and it, you know it's a secondary wor- world the speculative fantasy whatever but like those are things that are really powerful in our world as well mm-hmm. and that's like the connection back i don't know it's just yeah that to me was like the peak of the book i think mm-hmm. i also I think- liked how it was timu trusting his daughter like yeah. Um, knowing yep. that she would be able to decipher this, I thought was really, really powerful. Yeah. Now you could look at that as convenience, right? You no. Could. Do you like? Do you think people don't know their kids <sighs> and what they're capable well, of? Well, like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm saying you could perceive. This is what I'm saying. People could misread this and say it's convenience. Right? Well, that's the whole that book, is. though. I don't know like, about that part. There's a lot of things that I would think could be convenient. I don't know about that one. That was someone call very... it convenient. That's that. I'm... Oh, well, <laughs> that person's objectively wrong. Everyone's objective. <laughs> now, that's like a big plot point. Well, the thing too is like the intervention of the gods and like how much things can you say like, oh, it's convenient or is it like the gods playing in or things like that? I mean, I feel like in some ways the gods were underutilized in the last book though. Like I expected. That was, that was in purpose. Uh, Ken yeah. specifically said it was supposed to be the gods receding throughout the series. I yeah. agree though that I wanted more of them, but it I was very more. intentional yeah, I did that too. they were seceding. Was, the with things. each book they went. Similar to Malazan where at the beginning of Grace Kings, I was like, ooh, meddling gods. Like Malazan does this. And I was like, this is going to be sick. And I was, my expectations were off for that. 
I, I think it's fine the way it is, but like I did at times wish that it was more prevalent. Yeah. I was yeah. absolutely determined to knock a full star off when Thorio Thoreau died. Thorio? I was like, no. And I was like yeah. messaging Bookborn. And I was like, this book is never get if, if this is not resolved, it's getting a four star maximum. And I, <laughs> and I, I still didn't really like the like I mean, okay, like Lutho came back and like he had experienced mm -hmm. life of mortal. Like it kind of got right, but like, oh, I was furious for a while. Yeah. I was like, it was just so underutilized. Yeah. Is what it was. Like I was so hyped when Lutho became like when he left his god form, I was like, okay, this is gonna be really awesome. I don't know how oh, yeah. this is gonna play into the last book, but it's gonna be awesome. And like I think she Thorio filled the role that anybody else could have really filled in some ways. Yeah. You know, there was nothing distinctly like Lutho about it in some ways i don't know i just yeah. wanted so much more from it yeah. probably more thematic value out of it than um the character itself right like a god being in the world being able to be killed right for yeah, sure with humans Pro probably more of a thematic value but i would i would agree i think it's just one of the most like outlandish aspects of the book and so in some ways i thought it would be a little bit more dramatic hmm. mm -hmm. you know just because it is like a big deal so yeah yeah. I think Thoryu could have tied really like I think if she had either stuck around or been used differently like if she had actually like gone with the kids that were that were rescued by the Laiku yeah. um I think that actually probably would have been more valuable for her if we had had a um thematic um plot line of her helping discover old knowledge I think that actually would have been a lot better versus her just dying off in the field in my opinion <laughs> yeah <laughs> Kyle, so, you're muted. Kyle, you're Kyle muted. we can't hear you, bro. Kyle, you're muted. Control D. There we go. Okay. You guys hear me now? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I had to unplug my my headphones for a second, so it automatically muted me. Um, I was just saying that um, Thorio's like stretch my capacity for empathy because I found her very annoying in speaking bones because they would she'd be like, oh, oh, oh. Oh, a paper cut. I can't give a person a paper cut. If they have a paper cut, they'll bleed. And bleeding is bad. And I'm all about not suffering. And ah, uh, and it's like, listen, they're literally trying to murder you. Like they're trying to chop your head off. Like this is not the time. You know? So that it was very been, frustrating. It's Philip me. Chase. If Philip Chase is a character in a book. <laughs> Accurate. <laughs> yeah. I agree with Alex here. Talk Ball's uncle sucked too. Can't remember his name, but I really hated Volu yeah. or something. Oh my god, yeah. Volu, yeah. Oh, he was the worst. He was Especially the worst. good uncles in fantasy. Uh, uncle Benji Stark. Serious. Correct answer. Uncle. Uncle um, Sirius is a godfather. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was about to say Uncle Ben, but from the guy from Aragon, that uncle that died. I'm the only good about, uncles are dead uncles. Spoilers for Aragon. <laughs> yeah, what, is, for... what a spoiling series <laughs> left and right here. I've never <laughs> there... read Aragon. Are there any characters in, that you wish you saw more of in book four or that you wish had like Zomi. better arc? Zomi. Yeah. Zomi, I agree. Zomi. And, yeah. In Wall of Storm, she seemed like Zomi was going to be like yep. it, you know? And then I, yeah. I feel like I honestly can't even remember a lot of the things. She seemed like a very reactive character to what everybody else was doing and not a very active character, especially after anything after Wall of Storms, which sucked. Yeah. I just want to take a quick note here. We've been very negative for like 25 minutes. Oh. So for anybody watching it, we still all love this series. It's just oh, yeah. we've all been talking about the positives <laughs> well, for I'll six months. And now we can talk yeah. about the negatives. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is, there's like a lot, right? And people latch on to different things in a series like this and, and has so many ideas packed into it that I just like, I genuinely enjoy like bringing grievances and then being able to be told I'm wrong or like someone else yeah. saw that. Like, I actually, I value that a lot. Yeah. Um, one of the things I really loved in the final book is the creation story of Dara and the ages. It was right at the beginning of the book. I thought the fifth age sounded so cool. I would kill for a short story. Or like a novella set in that time period, I, in Dara, I would love that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Just in general, the uh, like the little stories in Speaking Bones were probably the best. Like mm -hmm. there was one in like Wall of Storms that I found kind of tiresome until like later on, and I could see like the thematic value. But like the story where it's like the Grace of Kings, the Courage of Brutes, and the uh, the third one that I'm breaking something of nobles. Of, yeah, the Courage of Nobles or something. But um, like that whole little like story, I thought was brilliant absolutely mm -hmm. like put a cap on the themes of the series for me yeah i mean it's just incredible like he didn't waste a single 
page. You know, every single moment, every single story, like it's it's like looking at a gigantic like picture and zooming in and seeing like all the tiny little details that somebody put in, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and you could even yeah. say that about the cooking competition, which is, I think, easily the most controversial thing that he did in the entire yeah. series. For yeah. me, it wasn't for me, but I even said in my review, I said, hey, it was excellently done. Like, first off, that put a cooking show like the balls. Like, I mean, that's just insane. <laughs> yeah. and, sure. and he did it. He did it very, very well. And we just talked about the Blossom game and stuff that like all that stuff was second half veiled thrown. Exactly. So without all that, yeah. with all that groundwork, you know, you're not getting those big, big moments. So like, mm -hmm. even though I didn't like personally enjoy that section, I think it I could see why people would. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's really well executed. And that's something I think is so hilarious is like how, cause Kyle did this. He's like, Oh yeah, just wait for the second half of the veiled throne. It's kind of out there. And like going into that, I was like, maybe we're going to have like a perspective of like a Garnoffin <laughs> or something, or like, there's going to be something really weird. And I'm like, That'd be oh. Cool. oh, I thought it would be totally cool. But I was like, okay, we're having a, Cooking Tom contest. Show. For like, a while, I was trying not to tell people what it was, but now it's kind of out there that it's a cooking section, yeah. so I'm a little bit more liberal with it, and I think it helps temper expectations a little bit. I agree, but um, yeah, and, and it is wild that. not knowing about it. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. more than that. You know, I, I I I wouldn't even count that as a spoiler because like yeah. it's the character work yeah. inside of that. Yeah. that Absolutely, and you know, the like ending Kinnery. of the series doesn't work without yep. that. Right. I mean, you could you could trim it, or you could choose to instead do a cooking competition. They could all you know. Um, be training like there's there's a different you way could you make could it a height. choose yeah, you could do something mm -hmm. else but yeah. the character development that happens in that part is what makes the ending be able to happen yes. in the way that it does so it is absolutely yeah. relevant big agree yeah. i'm just big on the wish it was trimmed like i kind of agree with what you said earlier jimmy i kind of wish i could have seen like what it would look like if book three and four had been trimmed enough just to become one volume and if it would have just been like a tighter read and would have been like yeah, and like you know how a lot of a lot of fantasy authors like lean on novellas now to get like that extra stuff in that like is very beneficial for the main story, but at the same time you can still ex like totally enjoy the narrative without it. I'm thinking like Don Shard and these type of things, right? Yeah. Like, like I do wonder, and I don't even necessarily think it would be the cooking competition, but like I just wonder if there's pieces here that like maybe could have been a novella or a short story or or maybe something else, and then the trilogy be something else. But I also think that's very arrogant of me to to claim it like, like you know what i mean like he's the artist he's the author he had a vision he completed his vision uh and hats off to him but i just wonder yep. you know i always yeah. think about structure of things so i could definitely see that having been the case like moving that to a novella the yeah. cooking competition like is so necessary to speaking bones that i don't think it could be totally exercised but i do think you could like say like we're gonna have a cooking competition over the next three days and then do some grace of king stuff where you're like and then at the yeah. end of the thing uh you know and there's like focus on a couple moments where like farah and um kinry like really bond but then otherwise not focus on it and then do a novella where you're like here's how what the cooking competition was about yeah Agreed. it's just it's such a shift of pace from grace of kings like in grace of yeah. kings you're covering so much time yeah in not... 600 pages and then you're going to like spending 300 pages on yeah well, and that's why i kind of feel like they feel like separate stories almost or like yeah they're separate books but like like i said earlier i kind of wish that the grace of kings could have been <laughs> its own story of like this rebellion and everything and that be like a trilogy and then the other books be its own separate thing of like the dynasty itself you know but yeah, yeah. that would be cool be interesting. too late <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> got to pull it back. Well, if they did a if they did a TV show, I could see that happening, like drawing <laughs> yeah. out book one for a couple seasons, or even heck, the whole show. I guess I don't know. Pete, I would like to hear because I know, like you're saying, this is a top five series for you. Like, w so give me your thoughts about the cooking because I think you really enjoyed it, right? Um, I think, I think there's some 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 of the, like I would value like going back to look at the cooking show again because I think there was there were twinges of things that I saw that like. I feel like the cooking show is also emblematic of a larger conflict and a larger theme. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure mm -hmm. what it was, but I want to go back and figure it out. Um, I, I, I think it was nice because I don't think Farah being Empress at the very end would have been as satisfying if we had not gotten to know her through the cooking competition. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, and she was lacking at that point too. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So like yeah. we hadn't seen her and her, want to experience the world and seeing that through mm -hmm. her eyes and her experiencing and stuff like that. Um, I, I, I think it would have come out of left field a lot more. <clears> of, <throat> Who like, doesn't have a better story than Farah the dandelion? <laughs> I mean, I think Farah, actually, I do think her arc's like one of the highest points for me in the, in the me back too. Half. Yeah. I, I like yeah. it a lot. Yeah. And it's even when I was reading the cooking competition, I said, yeah, like I'd be more interested in something else, but I was in on that 
that piece of mm-hmm. it. Like I, I was very in tune with what she was doing. I wanted to see more of it. So, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I think one of the things that is definitely there in the competition is the, um, the conflict between the unification of Dara and unredeemed Dara versus the hostility of just taking Dara back to what it was, if that makes any sense. Like the the corrupt mm-hmm. dude whose name started with a T, yet again, another T name, um, <laughs> that corrupt um, merchant, he had this extravagant, very Daran um, presentation of like, this is what it means to be Dara, and we have to be Dara. That is almost like an interesting mirror of the Layuku savagery that we see from Kuten Rogo in Speaking Bones. Hmm. And then you have kinry and farah and the blossom gang that is like hi this is everything about dara that you've forgotten and more of what we could be in the future and then that actually translates i think to the very end where farah is like hey we can be more united than everybody thinks we can and how she kinds of brings it all together with um farah and her, farah brings it together with her um what's whatever timu's daughter is um, but like she brings that together and yeah. tries to actually unite all of Dara together because that is what needs to happen going forward. Yeah. See, and I thought that, that was brilliant. Dara was going to do I've been this. jimmied. Yeah. You've been jimmied. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I genuinely like that is like now I appreciate the whole thing a lot more. That That is brilliant. I totally mm-hmm. agree with you. I was kind of of the opinion, like going into the Veiled Throne, that like Thera was going to be the one to kind of unite the peoples, just because she leaves Dara, but she's of Dara, and I thought it was going to be her, but really it is Farah that does it, and like you can kind of see that coming with the romance that starts to happen between her and the other guy whose name I can't remember uh, at the end of the Veiled Throne. Like as it's happening, you're kind of like, okay, this is this is the end game, right? And sure enough, it was, uh, but it made a lot of sense. You know, one relationship that I was just kind of like, and I know, I think you said, Kyle, that Ken is not officially, but like kind of hinted at maybe having more stories to tell with uh, Firo's um, love oh, interest yeah. and their child. Zantara. Yeah, I I just felt like that whole storyline, like maybe he has a bigger picture with it, but it just felt kind of pointless, I guess. Oh, I, I loved know. it. The That was the part that made me, the first part that made me cry in this book was when she realized that she didn't want uh, her kid to go through, down the same path as Fyro and she wanted to then go back to the islands and live the life that she had been spending her whole life trying to get away from and like trying to merge the two and she realized no what I need to do is now go back this is not the life I want for my kid and then she surrendered that was amazing that was top tier series moment for me well, I'm glad um, you enjoyed it and it was it was from a minor <laughs> character yeah like you know you're just a hater Objectively See, for, wrong, like always. I just, I just think if they had, tri- if he trimmed that out, I probably would have felt the same about the book. So. Well, it's not my fault you read it wrong. I did. <laughs> I feel like I have to caveat because, like, I do that kind of stuff a lot. But I'm just joking. Again, like you know, it all, comes off much better against. in voice than text. It does. Yeah, it does. No. <laughs> People think I'm just like throwing hands. I'm like, First I'm time I met kidding. Kyle, I was like, this guy's abrasive as shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got that vibe from you. I did. I was like, Jimmy thinks that I'm ready to fight, you know? Well, I also oh. dance and don't. I mean, clearly, I read the entire end of the yeah. book wrong. So uh, <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> yeah, Jimmy here probably hated the dandelion thing and everything. <laughs> I, You know, I actually I actually like the dandelion thing. And I even I put in my notes. I said I felt like the last 100 pages of this were like as good as any other point in the series. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah. and I just like Zomi, Thera, like all that. I'm in like I loved it. Um, and, and I kind of agree. I think Ian, you said it like I wanted more from Zomi the whole time. I just wanted more. Yeah. I just wanted more. Look, she's Boom. brilliant. And her introduction is yeah. so good in wall of storms when she just comes yep. out there, guns ablaze and saying like, yeah. you guys are wrong for this. You're wrong for that. I'm like, man, she is no nonsense. And then she starts being nonsense. And I was just like, and eh. then she gets arrested yeah. for half the book. And I was like, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> And then what, she doesn't play um, any role. That that's what I really didn't like is that she gets arrested, which fine. But then the whole conflict play, plays out, and then Zomi's like, "All right, guess I'll start a school." And I'm like, "But you're like a main character. Do main yeah. character things." So that's education's my important, again. Kyle. Yeah. Afterwards. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like the entire first half of All Storms, so much of that was building up Zomi, and then mm-hmm. the yes. back half was mm-hmm. Zomi. It was like Zomi's book almost in a lot of ways. Hmm. And then it was just after that, <laughs> just felt like a missed opportunity in some ways. And just kind of, mm-hmm. yeah, for sure. 
what role uh, would you like have rather see Zomi in in that back half of the book? Where would you have put her? Um, I mean, I would have put her. Like it's tough because, like, it's hard to nitpick that kind of thing because I did like with where everything ended up, but I would have yeah. liked her to just play an active role. I don't actually care mm -hmm. what she did, mm -hmm. an active role in any direction, but to put what I think is, if not the most dynamic character of like, that's not like an evil person uh, of the book on ice and then not do anything with them until, until it's over. I just didn't really like. Well, it kind of felt like she was kept alive just to reunite with Thera in the end. Like, I feel like she didn't have a lot of moments. And then all of a sudden you've got the reuniting between the two of them. And I was like, okay, this is satisfying, but she should have had something else to do, you know? But well, she did well, smuggle the kid yeah. out. Right. So she smuggled the yeah. kid out. And she was also the sister important. of, uh, well, she, what's his name? Henry. Yeah. She Henry. also started yeah. that school, which like, you know, I didn't put this together until I heard Ken say it, but like she spent her whole life trying to change the system and be like, this is like the system that yeah. I came up with. And she had those biases and she was like, I'm going to change this system. And, but she was still working within this time frame or within this uh, structure. And, you know, throughout the whole series, characters are telling her like, you know, you're, you're, very arrogant. Like she is a very arrogant character because she thinks she knows best and she thinks that she can change everything. And that, and then she's being humbled consistently throughout the series. Like she's learning more and she's learning how to operate in the shades of gray. And she understands what it becomes to be like a top tier level of like the government and how that changes. And then her then finishing act is to then be like, I'm done with this whole system. I'm going to do education my way and to um, create her own school where she teaches people. Cause you see, even with like, um, uh, Rati, Rati Yiru, which is one of the Blossom Gang, mm -hmm. who is a very, very great mm -hmm. character that people don't talk about enough. The girl, the woman in the wheelchair that mm -hmm. invents a bunch of stuff. Yeah, Phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and she is very, very smart, and she doesn't have the training that Zomi has. And you can see Zomi kind of act dismissively towards her at first until she realizes that, oh, this person is my equal, but just in a different way. And so yeah. she did have like an internal arc. I just, I just wish she was more active in the plot. Yeah, that's I agree. I like where yeah. she ended up. I think it was yeah. just getting there and actually being present in the mm -hmm. actual plot of yeah. book four. I think, I think they, that she could have put that Ken Liu could have put her. I think at least either involved more intrinsically, maybe intrinsically with Radiara and the Blossom Gang, and being humbled there. Or also another place I think that she could have been involved with was with um, what is it? Is it Kogu Yellow? Um, Kogu, yeah. Yeah, Kogu, Kogu going through the ledgers and trying to figure out Gia's plan, if he had spread that out, I think Zomi and Kogu could have had an active role mm -hmm. in actually being like discussing this of like, oh, I think this is going on. I think this is going on. And is this, who's this freaking merchant dude? Yeah. There's a version of the story where we get Kogu's perspective more. And he's yeah. trying to actively figure out what's going on, which mm -hmm. then leads to that like brilliant conversation between him and Gia. Yeah. But, but we have about. more <laughs> context of like Kogu's role because he just kind of disappears for two books. And I was yeah. saying that the whole time. I'm like, Kogu was awesome in The Grace of Kings. And then he just. Yeah, I was like, out. wait, who's Kogu again? And then I was like, oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that was one of the best moments for me when he talks to her and yeah, like just kind of lays really out awesome. the whole plan. It was like. Yeah. How, how much just of the, fell into place? How much of the plan was a surprise to you guys? Well, I knew like when she was like experimenting on the prisoners down there, I was like, she's gonna be mm -hmm. poisoning a lot of people. Like, I don't mm -hmm. know to what extent, but it's gonna be big, it's gonna be dramatic. I for a second I thought it was gonna be kind of like a red wedding type situation where she's just like, I don't trust any of you people, I'm gonna kill all my own people. And she sort of did that at the end with like her uh guards or whatever i can't remember their names either because i'm terrible with all these names You're the uh, Brian yeah when yeah, she does yeah, that like funny. that was such a huge moment i was like whoa you know i mean i wasn't really particularly attached to any of those characters but it That's was the most evil thing she ever did i think for it sure. was yeah. i mean it was huge and so and i understand why she did it it was just so infuriating yeah so uh, do you guys think, well, how do you think things would have turned out differently? Like, this is kind of the question I've thought about a lot is because in Wall of Storms, when things are like nearing the end, she's not willing to be taken capture. She's like, I'm going to set fire to this throne or whatever and just burn myself alive before they take me. And she does that, but then she jumps off. How do you think things would have turned out differently if she had died and it had been left to her children? Do you think that the dynasty could have survived or what do you think would have happened? Like, do you think G is necessary to Good the survival question. of of Dara as it was? I I don't. I'm not positive that she is. 
to be honest um, with you. To get to where the series ends in terms of like what she accomplished, I think she was the person who accomplished it. But I think the version of the story that ends with or with Gia dying at the end of Wall Storms has a more traditional fantasy narrative, which is that yeah. the war continues in book three, which the the economics of these islands don't make any sense to me. I always felt like the the two the two tiny islands with you know seventy seven like Laiusu on them. Like I just feel like they wouldn't like because everybody's very afraid. They're like, oh well, you know, hundreds of thousands of people will die. But I'm like, but you have ships. Just bring all your ships. They can't just gang up on 000, them. <laughs> they can't kill a hundred thousand people in a day. They just you just can't. There's not enough of them. Like kill them. So that's what I feel like. But it would have been a big war. And so I think that yeah, eventually mm -hmm. the Laisu would have lost. But there would just just would have been more war. And then at the end of it, it yeah. would have been Dara, and it would not have been Dara and Ukutasu. It would have just been. Hmm. So it would have been a more traditional, like you know, conquering the barbarians narrative. But I don't think Dara would have ceased to exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And we would have had Empress Thera, and her. You know, we had Empress Thera, Fara, and Fyro going after into the war, and I think Ava's story would have been a lot more tra tragic as well because she would have been forced mm -hmm. into being following up on her her mom's footsteps yeah that's another thing Aya, i thought her ending was brilliant yeah, yeah. Like, that is a character i would have liked to see more from mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i agree i wanted to see more from her um one moment that really sticks out to me though is when thera has to kill her husband to get his like Ooh. power and all that that was such a huge oh, moment yeah. where she has to be the one to stab him and all of that and then for them to like doubt her after all of that it was heartbreaking it was just yeah thera's the most sympathetic character for me yeah. yeah, yeah. G is my favorite to read about just because every time she's on the page, she's going to do something interesting. But Thera, I love the most for sure. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I liked her storyline. Uh, Puma Yimu is the only person that made me laugh in 2000 pages. So he's my favorite character <laughs> by uh, when he like kicks the the um, the like military monitor. because He's like, he's like, you can't do that. This is not we're not. And he just kicks him in the ass. And he's like, are you going to fight me about this? <laughs> that was really <laughs> funny. <Yeah. laughs> That was really good. Oh man, I got so mad though that part where Firo is like when Ghost Tan is like, "All right, let's just do a one-on-one -on -one battle." And I was like, "Don't agree to this, you idiot. Please dear God, don't agree to this. She's going to kill you." And then he's like, "Yeah, let's do it." I was like, "He's dead. It's over. He's dead." But that that turned out a lot differently, thank God, but I was so angry cuz it's such like a protagonist <laughs> thing to do, you know, of like, yeah. "Yeah, I can handle this. I'll be the one." And I get like it was the honor and all that jazz, but like, man, I was so pissed. I was so mad. <laughs> mm -hmm. The turtle was the one time where the god intervention being convenient. I was like, this is totally because it was so worse. You know, it was yeah. clearly god intervention. And I was like, okay, that's fine. Let's drop a turtle on its head. It's brilliant. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> that's about... DSX Machina, I think. <laughs> we'll take Classic. it. Yeah. Jimmy, who's your favorite character? And Alex, I actually don't know either of your favorite characters. Uh, Zomi through the first two, and I think overall, if I had to pick which one I liked reading about the most, it would have had to been Gia, um, especially in the final book. Mm -hmm. Like I felt like I was just waiting to get the Gia chapters. Yeah, I was know? the same way. I would too. I like missed the like Gia had chapters obviously through Veiled Throne, but they were like really short. I think, especially as we got to like the back seventy five percent of that book. Uh, so yeah, I would say Gia was the one I most liked reading about. And like I obviously didn't like her. But I, mm -hmm. she was the most complex and the most like thought provoking character, I think. Yeah. And she did. There's a lot of interesting things that Ken did with her, like the fact that she played into the idea that she's the empress that has like insatiable sexual desires and she's having these young guys and she's going to yeah. get a prisoner. It's just like really like some dark stuff there, but also like playing with that whole idea, right? Of, you know, uh, I mean, I thought of Cersei. I mean, obviously. Yeah. yeah. You know, immediate uh, comparison that I made, but it's a lot more than that and different. Um, and she's almost using that trope like in the story. It's, it, it's she's very... read a Game of Thrones. Oh, <laughs> she sure. That's a, a paper book. She sure has. Big fan. She's got a picture yeah. of Cersei on her mood board. It's like, yeah. 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 Gia, so... Gia actually is smarter. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Cersei's Cersei as dumb as a brick. <laughs> yeah. So much better than Cersei. I, I didn't say better. I, I think she's better. Nobody said better. <laughs> I said okay. better. I've only read a Game of Thrones, so I'm gonna stay out of the. I, <laughs> Before... I will say that when I read Game of Thrones oh, a, a fair bit ago, I didn't really enjoy the Cersei chapters that much because I thought she was a dumb as a box of bricks. Oh, oh, they're better on reread for sure because it you realize it's intentional. Like there's a part. This is not a spoiler for anybody who hasn't read it. Where 
she thinks her clothes are being shrunk by her yes. mates. Yes. But then you realize <laughs> so it's because she's been drinking so much wine, she's gaining weight. She's she like, doesn't even realize that. She's just she's hammered ha all the time. And <laughs> all right, I don't mean to make this into a song. Yeah. Fire yeah. Last <laughs> I'm fine. I promise. Last thing I'll say, but fun fact the first time I read through the series, I thought because everyone says, like, oh, Sarah's such a good schemer, I literally read it, read it, and I was like, she's so smart. Like, she fooled me the first time I read it. And then as be, I was, I've, I've read it like seven times now. Like, it's like, oh no, she's like the dumbest. Like, she is just straight dumb. I'm, I'm actually going to say one more thing about this because I am going to transition it back into what we were talking about, Beautiful. which is that um, what the reason the Cersei chapters are so good is that we very rarely get a character from their perspective who thinks they are intelligent. It's not something that is done very often. And so Cersei's chapters are very confusing in that way because she thinks she's brilliant. And so all the things she, she's scheming and she's scheming. And you're like, well, of course, these are good schemes. And then you think about it, you're like, no, it's not. Yeah. Uh, and Gia is like the total opposite where you're in her head. And she's so smart that like you don't know where she's going with it at all. Like it's almost the actual right. opposite. And you know? this is this is a, a play on perspectives. And this is why both Liu and Martin are phenomenal perspective writers. Like their their strength comes in perspectives. And I, I, I talked about the reason why he picked third person omniscient. And the funny thing about third person omniscient is a lot of people think that you get all the information. It's actually not true. Uh, Ken Liu bends third person omniscient to hide information from you oh, yeah. in a way that mm -hmm. makes logical sense for the perspective that he chose. Uh, so while he's explaining all this engineering to us and we get the flashback to this omniscient narrator, um, it's amazing because you're not in the limited perspective of someone's head, even though you may get some glimpses of what she's thinking. So he like really plays with the perspective throughout the entire series in, in multiple ways. Um, and I think that he, he that's one of his strengths as a writer. Yeah. I really do. Mm -hmm. yeah i absolutely sure. agree i also thought the third person omniscient perspective especially but i mean even through wall of storms just felt way less in intrusive i didn't even like think about it when i was yeah. reading books two through four whereas like, he, book yeah one, he, he very, knew what he was doing pete yeah. has a theory about the the thing that i never responded to do you want to tell everybody here and i can tell you why i don't agree oh wait wait, wait, wait. <laughs> are, are, are we talking about i can tell you why you're wrong are we um, going anyway, you're wrong. No, you were talking about the, the narration scheme of like um, you, you messaged me on Voxer about it. It was like that it's being told through a historical oh, context. Yeah. So this is actually isn't my theory. This is um, Gregory LaPerch. He was he's in the middle of Veiled Throne still. Um, but his theory was that it's being told through a historical context. It's being told basically as a history book and that they've put together scraps of what's happened over the years based on um, stories and all that other jazz, which really plays into the theme of we are what history says we are type of deal. Yeah, I can, I can see that. But at the same time, I think that this it does a really good job of like painting both cultures of the Liyuku and the Dara in kind of a shade of gray, you know, like there's no, there aren't really a whole lot of blacks and black and whites here. You know, it's a lot of like, I mean, I will say there are some really evil characters in the Liyuku <laughs> for sure, uh, <laughs> but there's some really evil characters on the Dara side as well. And so I think that there's a certain level of sympathy and understanding and respect in those that makes me kind of wonder about that historical context, because you always have that idea of like history is told by the victors or whatever, but I, mm -hmm. you yep. can see both sides here in some ways. But who was the victor then? If it was historical context, who would be the victor? Mm. I, I think that's the interesting well, question because there isn't one. Like, didn't feel like we're all the heroes in our own stories. Yeah. Well, the thing that gets me about this theory is that I think it's doing a lot of, um, like, I I think it would have to be more clear in the text like this just reminds me of like yeah. a song of ice and fire theories where people are like well maybe there was actually a, a velociraptor and then the velociraptor had a baby and then those are dragons i'm like but there's no actual evidence in the text um it's just fun to speculate about i think it would be a really cool idea i just don't think the ending of the book supports it i, I think there's also like narrative convenience um that probably wouldn't fit into a frame narrative that happened yeah. um I, but i agree i agree in the sense that like you could technically read it as like a true tell-all of Dar uh, history of Dara in this world, right? So mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of see um, what he's saying there. There's a line during the dandelion seed part. I specifically wanted Pete to talk about that first so I could talk about this, which like really confuses me. And I, I brought it up to Bookborn, and she didn't really have any thoughts. This was out of interest to her, so maybe it's interesting to you guys. But there's a part where it's like um, the dandelion seed is flying over, and then the, the narrator says, oh, um, if, this was, like, if this was a regular dandelion seed, it would fly away this way. But 
you figured out it's not a regular dandelion seed, right? And that's like the only line like that in the entire series. Like it's like talking directly to the reader. It was really strange. And I'm like, I wonder, that was what made me think. I was like, maybe there is like um, an overall perspective or we're being told this by a God or something, because that is the only moment in the series that I can remember where the narrator specifically turns and like breaks the fourth wall and talks to the reader, which is really weird. If it was, a, if there is a narrator based on what you just said, it'd be one of the gods. It has to be. Yeah, that's right. How yeah. else do they have the gods narrative been. and all that? I think yeah. it would be the all father or the all mother. Yeah, that's a good yeah. that's a good point. And, yeah. and I like that more than a, a history text. You know, mm. I, I think yeah. I think that actually It'd makes sense. Uh, in fact, you could get away with saying that. I think I, I don't see any conveniences that would work out because the God, then you get the beneficial, of, you know, your omniscient. That's kind of a little perk of the job. So that <laughs> that makes sense. It's pretty neat. Yeah, that dandelion yeah. moment is really the only time that the narrator shows his face a little bit. Yeah. Because every other time it's just all about everybody else. But then you have this dandelion and that little comment where it's like, is there somebody else there? You know, it kind of broke the fourth wall almost a little bit. Yeah. And how obscure yeah. Gia's plans are actually makes sense in this perspective, too, because we are told specifically that the gods were perplexed by Gia. They couldn't mm -hmm. figure her out. I think that yep. was, was that Veil I Throne? love that. It was, yeah, yeah, I think so it was Veil That was a really impactful moment where that's like, I think that's whenever I was like totally sold. Like, I, I need to figure out what the hell she's doing. Um, I think that also furthers the idea that it could be like the all mother or the all father. That makes sense. That's cool. Yeah. yeah I, I like that. that. Well, uh, we've, we've been talking uh, about speaking bones a lot in general. Um, do you guys have any other thoughts regarding wall of storms or the grace of Kings or anything like that? Garanoffin's rock. Garanoffin's yeah, rock. <laughs> They are so cool. Also the moment I, I forgot about this until right now, the moment where they get free and like have their own moment of like oh, rebellion. Yeah. I was like, holy crap. That was cool. Everyone's getting to come up. Let's <laughs> yeah. go. Yeah. yeah. I, I think they're definitely one of my favorite fantasy creatures for sure. Yeah, I yeah. mean, the only other person who I've read that does dragons in as interesting a way is like Robin Hobb. I really love what she I mean, does with dragons. They have antlers, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like they're not mm -hmm. even like they're not even they're dragons. Cool. Yeah, they're, they're not like, dragons. Oh, they're dragons. dragons. They are dragons. Yeah, they're they're dragons, dragons <laughs> but like so we, much different. Right? Yeah, but that's because you guys are you guys are <laughs> boxing in what dragons are. It yeah, is we'll a be whatever they want. Giant fire breathing animal. It is they don't dragon. have to be fire breathing. It's they are fire breathing. But they don't. Oh no, no but I'm saying that Garinifens are giant Garinifens. lizardy. <laughs> they're Garinifens. That's what Ken Liu says. All right. What does he uh, know? <laughs> Seriously, who is he? Who, who he is? Come on. He ever Can we, did anybody ever ask Michael Kramer the correct spelling? Garanathans. Uh, <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure he changed it as he went through the series. He did. He so said he, it he was, was on that Roy was, Doitrees. Bio. Oh yeah. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> it was piece. Jin Mazzotti in book. It was Jin Mazzotti in book one, and then Gin Mazzotti in book two. Yeah, that like, bothered me a lot. Gin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jim Mazzotti, by the way, MVP. Jim Mazzotti was awesome. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Definitely in the top five characters for sure. Um, well, Jim I think my favorite moment of the whole series is the part where she dies. And then I think, was it Thera or Zomi? I can't remember now. I think it's Zomi. Thera. Oh, Zomi, who has to electrify her body to yep. get her to raise the flag. That was like one of the most Dude. dark oh, but yeah. powerful moments. That was the most cinematographer, like cinematic part yep. where it's like her, like where like Daff dies Dude. so that then she can like, oh my God, I just want to see that on screen. Well, so Wall bad. Storms is the shit. <laughs> I know. It Wall is Storm. so good. Yeah, that battle so is like good. probably, apparently I like naval battles more than I was thinking because I was thinking about my favorite battles and that and Black uh, and Water Blackwater Bay. are like, Blackwater. two of the best ever and i'm like oh they're both on water so yeah that's true yeah wall of storms is the tops though i mean yeah. there's no I, I, uh, it is nothing the, the, better the introduction the introduction of the layuku in general to wall of storms was so oh, like that moment with that. rutho when he's like let me tell you my plan oh, and then they just oh. cut his head off you're like you he idiot. was the dumbest but like dumbest in the way that like smart people are sometimes you know like, yeah just yep. like deluded yeah yep He's like, this is a savage. What is he going to do? Yeah. <laughs> Nothing. Yeah, and being punished for stupidity like that is something I appreciate in my books. Like, I love stupid people yeah. getting punished. I felt really bad for the guard captain who just, he just luck of the draw. He just woke up that day and they were just like, you're going with him. And he was like, dude, this is this is not okay. Let's get out of here. And they were, he was just not listening to him. And then that guy died too. And I was like, oh man. Listen so to your right, gut. Poor went out for my homie. Yep. Should have just run, <laughs> man. Should have just run. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, I also kind of want to talk about Mata, Mata Zindu 
Yeah, it's not Mata Zindu. Oh, yeah, yeah Mata Zindu. I almost said Mata Peter Ray. Um, <laughs> do you guys, how do you guys feel like he is at all? Like, do you feel like he plays much role like as a shadow in the final books at all? And if so, how do you think? Well, yeah, Fyro and him well, are kind of connected in a way. Right? Yeah. 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 Mode, I mean, he's definitely influencing all the people who are still associating with him. As a, so, so let me yeah, change my question. Icon. How do you think things would have turned out if Cooney had not won their struggle and it was Mata Zindu? Chaos. Endless war. war. Just like, yeah, I think it would just be. Well, you could might have had an easier time. Yeah, it might have. Yeah. yeah, I actually yeah. I don't I think they would have lost if it was Mata because Mata is a really good military commander, but he's not good at organization and like, yep. you know, or innovation. Just, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, he went through strength. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, some of the uh, the things they had to overcome through engineering and problem solving wouldn't have been they wouldn't have had the means to do so because all the money would have been funneled to military yeah. operations or been like an occupation. Yeah, Mata would never have been able to figure out how to defeat the Garenafins. Like it would have <laughs> just been accidental after losing twenty thousand soldiers. Mata yeah. would have insisted that they find a way to get up in the air with the airships and have soldiers dive into the Garinif and Maws in order to tear them out yeah. from the inside. They wouldn't even have airships. Bodies. Just throw airships as many bodies at them as possible. Mata Zindu is awesome. Yeah, though. yeah. He would have. Been like, <laughs> yeah, I love I Mata Zindu. Wanna... Mata Zindu had that kite. He'd be fighting Garinifins on his kite, which would be badass. That would be sick. Yeah. Heck yeah, that yeah, would he be. He was a cool character. He was, he was like yeah. seven, Very eight cool. or something, whatever. He yeah, he's like a, a mini you. Yeah. <laughs> Double pew. <laughs> they were like, he's like <laughs> many. Alex is like relating most to Mata Zindu. He's like, finally, a guy that's my height. Yeah, I can rock with this. <laughs> yeah. I was like, whoa, they... my knees hurt. <laughs> my guys, Alex is only 6'8. All right. Only 6'8. Oh. 6'8. Eight. Six, eight. So. All right. Well, uh, I think we only wanted to go about an hour and a half and we're getting close to that time. So do you guys have any final thoughts or comments or questions you wanted to pose to the group? Do we think we'll get more Dara? I think so at some point. I think Years. it'll be a while down. I, I think would love it. Yeah, I think he's burnt out. Yeah. But he just kept talking about Zen Kara so much. And I was like, Zen Kara? And he was like, I I mean, like, I, I don't want to do more things. So I think so. I, I don't know. Cool. We'll see. I think, yeah, it's too, he's developed it too much. I think part of him will, will always live there. And so I think it'll always be in the back of his mind that he could, you know, he's got more stories there that he's already probably thought through and he could just throw out if he wanted to. But mm-hmm. do you we'll think see. he's going to do another like full narrative or just go do short stories for, a little I bit? could see short stories first. Like yeah. he might have an idea that he, he would find best suited to explore within the context of Dara. So it would just be like a random side story set there. That's what I think is the most likely for us to get first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, this yeah. feels like his magnum opus. Like I can't think, I feel like this is the Ken Liu story and like, yeah, he has a lot more stories to tell, but like something of this grandeur, I would be amazed and shocked. Yeah. He, so. I don't think he'll ever do another Epic series. Like I could see like a standalone novel, but he, he kept being like, I worked on this for like 12 years and I yeah. only sold one book, you know? So I don't see it. It's still just, it's so impressive to me how, like, how ambitious the series was and that he ended it and tied it all together. And mm-hmm. yeah, they were long books, but still four books. That was just. And that's why I'm, I am glad that I read all of it and I finished it yeah. now. And it was very yeah. satisfying because, like, that's one of the reasons. And I love that he, like, committed to it and he finished it. Like, I know it's all, you know, author's choice. It's up to them whether or not they continue or finish series. But that's, like, why I haven't continued on with the Game of Thrones books is because I have a hard time committing to a series that isn't done and there's no, like, foreseeable done, you know? Hmm. Endings but are I, overrated. I, I want to read them, and I will, but, like... could read the first Read them in January. We're doing a read-along in January. We're going to make Jimmy do his next read-along. Is that what we're doing, oh, yeah. Jimmy? No, but they're, they're, uh, Joanna I mean, yeah. is doing a read-along in January. I'll, be honest, uh, I'll probably join. I'll probably join. <laughs> I've, I've been looking for an excuse, although I keep committing to buddy reads like Alex and I, we talked about buddy reading uh, Gardens of the Moon at some point. And I'm like, God, what am I going to do oh, that? Yeah. I'm also yeah, reading God. that with, uh, like with Bookborn in 2023. We're starting Malazan. So. <laughs> oh, please bring this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I will. Listen, I'm going <laughs> to so good. Get, I'm going to like beg Philip. Please explain this to me. You know, so. yeah, you got to <laughs> have Philip on literally like, <laughs> community like hand holder. Like he got yeah. me through the first forms. Like, all right, little guy, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I will definitely You're need good that. You're to go. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's so many resources that are just so yeah. absolutely helpful. Yeah. With and, and in mm-hmm. a lot of ways, I mean, they're totally different, but I think the Dandelion Dynasty does have some of, 
like you know it's interesting i like we're talking about care like i wish there was more zomi but like zomi wasn't the vehicle chosen like that happens in malazan at times and then like all the time yeah all the time really so it's just <laughs> i i actually do see some relation between the two series you know yeah i have no doubt that i'm gonna love malazan like all of yeah, the books so. that i love people are like oh yeah like you're gonna love this and I'm like, oh, i'll anyway. never guarantee anyone loves it but i do yeah. I, i'm I sure they've read books book that i think are ago. slogs but I, I have i have the patience of a champion like i will push <laughs> through Yes. Everybody has one book they hate in Malazan, it seems. Not, not universally. Like, I know yeah. Philip likes them all. But, like, a lot of people have that, like, Dust of Dreams, where they're just like... They and I love all. Dust of Dreams. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh I, liked all, I liked all 10. That's my hot take for Malazan. I liked all 10. I liked really? every I one of them. I didn't know that. Yeah. Every Toll the Hounds dragged for me, but Dust of Dreams is so underrated, man. Just yeah, there was mm. not a moment where I was like, I'm not really having fun. Like I was just <laughs> in the whole way. Um, yeah. Because, and, and this is something in a Danny line, if you're curious, I think it, it will aid that. If you get frustrated, it will discourage you. And I think Dandelion does yeah. that a lot as well because of how many ideas are in here and how many things get explained. Same thing with Malazan. Yeah, part of it is just like trusting the author. Like mm -hmm. if I had exactly. read Malazan two years ago before I yep. discovered BookTube, I, I don't think I'd get very far. I, I think no you need the community. I like just knowing That's that it's like it's this big thing and like, you know, how well respected it is. And like the people that tastes I really like, like Malazan, some of it's their favorite series of all time. I'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt when I get confused or something. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and that's really why I'm so grateful for the booktube community with this series in particular, because I am a serial series starter, but I never finish series. I don't know. Hey, you just said you, you only read series that are finished and then you're not reading the end. I know. <laughs> We're going to shame I want, you. I want to know it's there. I want to know it's there. All right. I started like 20 series this year and this is the first one that oh I have finished. The duality of man. Like, okay. I mean, the problem just, is, <laughs> the problem, there's so many series out. to read. So I'm like, I got to read the first book here, the first book there. I've read so let, many first books. Let me this ask year, you man. a legitimate question. Ian. <laughs> yes. Why don't you God. just uh, like think about it in your head as there are five Game of Thrones books to finish? Yes. And well, Fire and Blood. Blood. And then Fire and Blood. That's a complete narrative. You could, I mean, I don't recommend starting there. Okay. Blood so, slaps. Okay. Slaps. So I need you guys to tell me, do I read it now or do I wait until. January. Wait till January. Wait It'll be way more fun, especially yeah. if you're like um, diving in for the first time. Like I, um, I have a couple friends who like didn't like like uh, Jordan Reads is gonna go on it, and she did not like game. Like she stopped liking it after like the third book. Okay. And I'm gonna be like, yeah. I'm going to convince you this series is fantastic. And so well, every, I, uh, every single chapter. <laughs> yeah, I read well, the first book and I loved it so much. It was amazing. Oh, you're gonna be fine. You're yeah, be fine. So, noir. So. It's like a murder yeah. mystery. It's so good. And I love you guys mysteries. Are gonna learn like about my, my homie Balon Swan. So. That's what you're gonna do. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, any final thoughts? I was gonna just say overall, I'm amazed by the series. I I am sticking with my like four star rating for Speaking Bones just because of some of the frustrations I had. But overall, I'm so glad that I read the series, and I think that is the most impressive fantasy series I may have ever read. Hmm. If that makes sense. Like I, yeah. I'm just amazed that one person could do all this in only 12 years <laughs> or however long it's been. Yeah, yeah. that is yeah. It's true. Yeah. I guess speaking yeah. most five stars because, um, emotional resonance and thematic yeah, depth, that's I did. um, overcomes seven pages of admirals backstory <laughs> to me. Uh, but it was close. It was close, but no, I, I just love the series. I think it, it was such a, stunning achievement and i'm really really excited to reread because i've read get uh, grace of kings twice but it was before i had started any other so i'm really excited to do like a full reread probably next year and just like soak in all of the stuff that he set up and, i can yeah. see that you know i yeah. might give it five stars on a reread if i can have like a month break in between each one <laughs> yeah. yeah that really worked for me because like i sequence everything so i have breaks between all my books and the break really really helped just yeah. get me excited for speaking bones yeah sure. awesome well thank you all for being on the stream i appreciate it i'm glad that we all could make it work out i wanted rj to be on here too but i didn't want to keep pushing it back because originally this was supposed to be at like the end of july and then like <laughs> it kept kind of like i was like trying to juggle everybody's schedules and when i got five yeah. out of six i was like all right i'll take five yeah. out i'm of gonna six, call so. myself out here and realize that i'm a moron because i was literally like at like at different times in the same day Ian would be like, hey, when do we want to schedule our Speaking Bones live chat? And then Alex would be like, 
hey, are we going to do a Speaking Bones live chat? And my brain never was like, why don't we just do one together? I was yeah. like, we'll and then, do two and schedule them separately. <laughs> Kyle was like, oh, I'm supposed to be on this other live chat. I was like, why didn't you say something? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, uh, thank you all for joining, and uh, thank you, Pete, for sticking out the read along with me. Uh, I know all of you were kind of reading on your own time, but Pete and I both read one a month, so I'm grateful. Yeah, for that. no, it was awesome, awesome that you guys. I took a chance to start another series in a year that I wanted to end a bunch of series, and yeah, I just yeah. asked him. I was like, "You want to join?" He was like, "Yeah, sure." I was like, "I don't think you knew what commitment you were committing." No, to. <laughs> I had no idea, but it worked out. Also, I think Pete likes it oh, yeah. the most out of all of us, so it was yeah. a big win for him. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you guys and uh, catch you later. See you guys. Bye. Bye.